In this lecture, we're going to introduce the fundamental theorem of calculus and do various examples. So the theorem is stated as follows. If a function, which we'll call, say, little f, is continuous on a, B, the closed interval A, B, and big F is an antiderivative, antiderivative of little f on A, B, then we have the following super powerful formula. I mean, this is really, really huge. By the way, an antiderivative means that if you take the derivative of big F, it's going to be equal to little f uh, everywhere on this interval. So the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if you have the definite integral from A to B of little f with respect to x, so normally we had to use um, you know, limits and stuff. We had to take the limit of a sum, and the process was very, very difficult. This gives us a formula. This is equal to the antiderivative of little f, so big F, evaluated at the uppermost limit of integration, minus the antiderivative of little f, so big F, evaluated at the lower limit of integration. So it's a really cool equation because it relates everything we were doing with definite integrals back to antiderivatives, right? So it's a big, big step, and it makes the computations so much easier, right? So much easier. Um, a couple remarks that um, need to be mentioned here. So perhaps uh, the most important remark, or an important remark, is that you don't need to write the constant of integration anymore. So whenever you're doing definite integrals, you don't need um, the constant of integration. So don't need, don't need to add C. And two, the second remark uh, is to be careful. <laughs> so we're working, we're going to be working with numbers now. We'll have a lot of fractions. Um, so you want to just take your time and, you know, go through things slowly. Let's start with a simple example uh, that we can work out. So you see how to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's start off simple. Let's say we're integrating uh, from 1 to 2. And we just have x with respect to x, so x dx. So we're integrating uh, x with respect to x. So basically, according to the formula, it's going to be big F of b minus big F of a. So typically what you do um, is you just integrate it, and then you don't write um, the c. So here we'll use the power rule. So you add 1 to the exponent, so it's x squared, and then you divide by 2, so it'll be x squared over 2. And then normally you'd put a plus c, but you don't have to put a plus c. Um, just to indicate that you don't have to, I'm going to put it this time, just so you see what happens. So this is just the antiderivative, right? This is wrong. We have to have the antiderivative evaluated uh, at the top limit of integration, the upper limit and then subtract it from the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to use a double bracket like this, and I'm going to put a 1 here, and I'm going to put a 2 here. And what this notation tells you is that you first plug in the 2, right? because this, this is your big F of x right here. Let me just circle it. This is big F of x. Right? So if you plug in a 2, you get 2 squared over 2 plus c. Right? That's, that's big F of 2, right? because you plugged in 2 into big F, minus, and then plugging in 1 to big F, it's big F of 1. Let me see that, so let me just scroll down here and write it for you. So this is big F of 2, and this is big F of 1, right? Just using the formula, 
which again is f of b minus f of a. I think a lot of people don't actually think about the formula, which is fine. You don't really have to, but I just want to show you that we are actually using it, right? We're actually using it. And I think that's lost uh, in calculus because you take a calculus course and then you learn how to do this and you just keep doing it um, without thinking about what's happening. So every time you do a definite integral, you're using um, the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is super key. And so what happens here is you get a four over two, which is two, right? Because this is two squared, so it'll be two plus c. You can actually drop the parentheses here, so it'll be two plus c, right? Because that's four over two. And this is minus one half minus c, right? minus one half minus c. Oh, this is cool, right? Look, the c's cancel. That's why you don't have to write the plus c, right? So, um, so two is really four halves. Just thinking of it as a number over two, and then minus one half. So that's going to be three halves. So much quicker than the approach we would take uh, using uh, limits and all of that stuff. So um, very very fast way to to find. Um, you know, definite integrals now, thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, a comment here on the notation, by the way, so just uh, some comments on notation. Nota notation. <laughs> it's not that hard to spell it. Notation. Okay, so in this example we had, uh, it was a 1 to 2 x dx, and um, I wrote it with a double bracket, right? You could do a single bracket, so you could do x squared over two, and then you could do this, okay? Or if you prefer, um, you, could, you could simply uh, use a line. So you could do x squared over two with a line like this. Um, you can use a double bracket, right? You could do x squared over two and a double bracket. So all of these are acceptable notations. Just use whatever you feel best fits the situation. Um, I think that's the best way. So I usually do the line or the bracket. I, I go back and forth between notations. Let's see if I can find um, another example that's a little bit um, harder that we can do uh, just for practice. Um, I guess I'll make one up. Here we go. Let's see. Let's try um, just again, maybe let's put a zero here and um, a three here. Okay, and um, actually, let's make this make this a pi. Do a trig function. Let's integrate um, cosine x with respect to x dx. So, you know, if we were doing this using the limit process, it would be much more challenging. So, thankfully, <laughs> we can use all of our integration formulas now to compute definite integrals, which is which is huge. So here, we're integrating cosine. So we're thinking, what's a function? whose derivative is going to give you cosine. Well, the derivative of sine is cosine, so this is equal to sine x. And then I'm just gonna use a single bracket here. Then you put the zero here and the pi here. Notice I didn't write the plus c, right? We know it's not necessary because uh, the plus c's, they, they cancel each other out. And this notation means that you first plug in the pi, and then you subtract, and then you plug in the zero. So you plug in pi, so you get the sine of pi minus, and then here you get the sine of zero. On the unit circle, um, sine is the y-coordinate, right? So here's the unit circle. This is zero, this is pi, and you see that sine is the y-coordinate on the unit circle. So at zero, it's zero, at pi, it's zero, so you get zero minus zero, so you get zero, so that's the answer there. Intuitively, let's think about what this means. We're integrating cosine uh, from zero to pi, so if you think about the graph of cosine, So cosine of zero is one, right? And then cosine of pi over two is zero. And then cosine of pi is negative one. So this is pi here. Okay, this is pi. And so we're basically integrating. I'm use a different color. This is kind of an interesting example. I just picked one and um, all examples can be interesting. If you, well, most examples. <laughs> so. So integrating here, we got the area under the curve, right, from zero to pi over two. But then over here, it's like we got the opposite of the area under the curve. So if you add these up, um, you're gonna get zero. So if you add this piece here to this piece here, this piece here is the opposite of this piece, right? So you end up getting zero, which is what we got in our definite integral.
In this example, we're going to find the definite integral of 3 over x squared minus 1 from 1 to 2. So the first thing we have to do is write this in a way that allows us to integrate it. So we'll start by taking this x squared and bringing it upstairs. This becomes the definite integral from 1 to 2 of parentheses 3x to the negative 2 minus 1 and then dx. And the reason we did that is so now we can apply the power rule for integration to integrate this. So when we apply the power rule, basically we add one to this exponent and divide by the result. So it will be equal to, so it'll be three x, and then one plus negative two is negative one. And then we divide by negative one, minus integrating one that's just gonna give us x. And this is a definite integral, so we don't need the plus c. I'm going to use a bracket, and then I'll write the lower limit of integration here and the upper limit here. Okay, so this is equal to, you can go ahead and put the negative in the front. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to write it like this. I'll write it as negative 3 over x. Basically just taking this and bringing it back downstairs and making the exponent positive. I just put the negative up top, minus x, and we're going from one to two. Okay, so first we plug in the two, subtract, then we plug in the one. So this is equal to, see plugging in the two for all the x's, get negative three over two, minus two, and minus, now this is two terms, so it's really important to use parentheses. So parentheses, negative three over x, or one, because x is one, minus one. Right, so plugging in the two, let's check two here, two here, minus, and then plugging in the ones, everything looks good. Okay, let's clean this up. This is negative three over two, minus two, and here we have um, this minus here. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it out here for a second. Minus three minus one, is minus four, okay, so this is gonna be negative three halves, minus two, and then plus four, plus four. This is equal to negative three halves, and then minus two plus four is plus two. And we have to add these. Easy way to do that is think of two as a number over two, so you can write this as negative three over two plus four over two. When you add these, you're just gonna get one over two, which is the answer to the definite integral. So very, very easy to, to mess up in this process. So um, yeah, just gotta be careful with these. In this video, we're going to integrate sine x minus two, and this is a definite integral. Uh, which means that after we perform the integration, we're going to evaluate the results at the limits of integration. So we can just go ahead and jump into it and integrate. So when you're integrating sine, you have to think backwards. So you have to think, what is a function whose derivative is sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is gonna be negative cosine. Because when you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. And there's a negative here already, so it's like negative, negative, so it's positive. When you integrate two, you just get two x. And then we're going from zero to pi. So you can use, there's three choices here. You can use a line, you can use a bracket, or you can use two brackets. And the zero goes here, and the pi goes, goes up here, so pi. All right, good stuff. So now we plug in the pi first. So plugging in the pi, we get negative cosine pi minus 2 pi. So this is just replacing all of the x's with pi's at this point. Then you always subtract no matter what. So minus. Now you plug in the zeros. So I'll put a parenthesis here. So negative cosine 0 and then minus 2 times 0. I didn't skip any steps. Um, I don't know why, but maybe it's better not to in this example. So first you plug in the pi. Okay, then you put a minus and then you plug in, then you plug in the zeros. 
Okay, cosine of pi is negative 1. So this is going to be negative negative 1 minus 2 pi. Cosine of 0 was 1, so this is minus negative 1 minus 0. I'm showing like every single step. It's kind of fun. Uh, this is 1, right? This is 1 minus 2 pi. Mm, interesting. Oh, that's fun. Plus 1. And let's not mess up here. 1 plus 1 is 2. <laughs> 2 minus 2 pi. And that is the final answer. I hope this video has been helpful. Take care. In this video, we're going to evaluate this definite integral. So before we do that, we want to write everything as u to a power. You'll notice we have two terms up top and one term on the bottom. So whenever you have that, you want to break it up. So we're gonna break it up as follows. So we have the definite integral from one to four. So it's this over this, so u over, and I'm gonna go ahead and write the square root of u as u to the one half. It'll just make it easier to simplify. So it's u over this minus, and then this over this. So it'll be six over u to the one half. And then we have our du here. Okay, now we can simplify this. So we still have the definite integral. So what you do here is you subtract the exponents. You have u to the first power, and then here you have u to the one half. So you do one minus one half, so you get one half. So this is u to the one half minus, and then six. Then you can take this and you can bring it up. And when you bring it up, the exponent becomes negative. So this is u to the negative one half, and then we have our du. So again, whenever you have like two or three or more terms up top and a single term on the bottom, that should automatically come to mind. Can you break it up using this strategy? So it's super, super useful. Okay, so now we're just going to integrate. So when you integrate both of these pieces, you just use the power rule. So you add one to the exponent and divide by the result. So we have one half plus one. So it's really one half plus two halves. So that's, that's three halves. So this is u to the three halves. Then when you divide by three halves, you really multiply by the reciprocal. So instead of dividing by three halves, I'm gonna put a two thirds here because that's the reciprocal. Uh, okay, the same thing here. So now this one, it's minus. I'm gonna leave some room here, six. Notice I'm leaving some room here for, the, for whatever's gonna go here. So we're adding one to this. So negative one half plus one is one half. So this is u to the one half. And then again, dividing by one half means we multiply by two. So times two. Okay, and then you have three choices here. You can put a line, you can put a bracket, or you can go all out and do two brackets. It just depends what you're comfortable with. So line, bracket, or two brackets. And we're going from one to four, so then you put these numbers here. These are called the limits of integration. All right, let's, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and clean this up a little bit. So I'm gonna write this again. This is 2 thirds u to the 3 halves minus 12 u to the 1 half. And then we have our limits, let me just write it again, uh, 1 to 4. All right, so first you always plug in the top number. So it's always the top number first. You subtract, then you plug in the bottom number. So plugging in the top number first, we get 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 4 to the 3 halves, Okay, minus 12, four to the one half. So all I've done so far is simply put a four wherever there is a u, let's check that. So two thirds, four to three halves, check. Minus 12, and then four to the one half, check. Minus, and now we have to plug in the ones. That's gonna be a little bit easier, because whenever you put a one where the u is, it's just gonna become one, right? Because one to the three halves is one, u to the one half is one. So I'm just gonna get two thirds minus 12. So two thirds, minus 12, yuck. Typically you get fractions in these problems, um, so that's probably the most annoying part about these problems is, is the fractions. Okay, so I don't have a calculator in my hands, so I have to do it all by hand. So four to the three halves. So here's the old school way, or here's how I do it. I don't know if it's the old school way, maybe it's new school. So the two goes in the little pocket, always, every time you put the two in the pocket, the four goes here, and you can put the three on the outside. Or you can put it on the inside too, but it's better to put it on the outside. Two goes in the pocket, 
pocket, always. Two goes in the pocket, two goes in the pocket, two goes in the pocket, put the four there. The three, you can put it on the outside of the inside. Square root of four is two, so you get two cubed, so you get eight, boom. So that's two thirds times eight. Two thirds times eight, that's beautiful. Minus, oh, square root of four is two, that's easy, right? So 12 times two, that one's not so bad. Here, my, minus two thirds, uh, minus 12, I'm just gonna distribute it so it'll be minus two thirds plus 12. Let's just put it all together before we start adding fractions. Let's see what, what arises from all of this. So here we have 16 thirds, 16 thirds minus 24, minus two thirds, plus 12, right? So just all I did there was multiply the two and the eight. And let's see, 16 thirds minus two thirds is 14 thirds. That's combining this one and this one. Negative 24 plus 12 is minus 12. To finish this uh, computation, we want to write 12 as a number over three. So we can multiply it by three over three. So this is 14 thirds minus 36 thirds. 14 minus 36 is negative 22 thirds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because 36 minus 14 is, is 22. And so that should be the final answer. I hope this video has been helpful to anyone who is working on some calculus. Take care. This video, we're going to evaluate this definite integral using u substitution. So whenever you're using u substitution, usually u is your inside function. So in this case, a good first attempt for our u is the piece inside the square root. So we'll start by letting u equal to 3x plus 1. Then you always compute du as normal. So du is the derivative of u, so du. Here we compute this derivative. The derivative of x is 1, so we simply get 3dx. And the derivative of 1 is 0. Then when you get to this step, you're always supposed to make this look like this. So here we have 3dx and here we have 1dx. So we have to get rid of the 3. So to do that, we'll just divide both sides by 3. So divide by 3, divide by 3. So we end up with du over 3. Typically what we do in this point, at this point is write it like this, 1 third du equals dx. Because in the next step, when we make the substitution, what we typically do is factor out the constants. Okay, so if this was an indefinite integral, like if they didn't have these numbers, we would just go ahead and make the substitution. However, this one has limits of integration. So whenever you make a u substitution and you have limits of integration, you have to change them. So these are x values, right? Because we're integrating with respect to x. We are converting to u, so we have to turn them into u values. So let's carefully, carefully do that. So when x is equal to one, we're gonna take the x and plug it in here and that will give us the u. So u equals three times one plus one. Three plus one is four. So there is our u. And then when x is five, we end up with, let's see, x is five, we get three times five. So u equals three times five plus one. So you get 15 plus one, so we get 16. This is a super important technique. I once got stuck on a math problem for over a week because, this, because I didn't do this. This was the missing step, so it's so, so important. So when x is one, u is four. When x is five, u is 16. All right, now we're gonna make the substitution and we're gonna change everything. So let's see, let's be careful. So the dx is one third du. So we can pull out that one third. So one third, then we have the du. Then we have the one up top. On the bottom, we have the square root of u. And then our limits are now u values. Let's see, when x is one, u is equal to four. So this becomes a four. And when x is 5, u is 16. So this becomes a 16. Really, really, really nice. Okay, so now we have to integrate it. So basically, um, this is 1 over u to the 1 half. So what you do is rewrite it uh, like this. 
1 over u to the 1 half. I was going to skip a step, but I didn't. The step I was going to skip is I was going to bring it upstairs. So when you bring it upstairs, what happens is the exponent becomes negative. And so the reason you do that is because to integrate this, you want to use a formula, right? So you want to use the power rule. So now we can do that. So basically, you, you add 1 and divide by the result. So this is equal to 1 third u negative 1 half plus 1 is 1 half. So this is 1 half. And then we're dividing by 1 half. When you divide by 1 half, you really multiply by the reciprocal. So 2 over 1. So 2 over 1. And then we're going from 4 to 16. So from 4 to 16. Again, we add 1 to the negative 1 half. So we get 1 half. We divide by 1 half. But when you divide by 1 half, you really multiply by the reciprocal. All right, let's clean this up a little bit. This is 2 thirds. And I guess now we can plug in the numbers. So you plug in the 16. So you get 16 to the 1 half. You subtract, and then you plug in the 4. So you get 4 to the 1 half. So this is 2 thirds. It's working out quite nicely. 16 to the 1 half is the square root of 16. That's going to be 4. Right, 4. <laughs> so yeah, 4 to 16 is 4. And 4 to the 1 half is the square root of 4, uh, which is 2. So you get 4 minus 2. It's a really bad place to get stuck. So this is 2 thirds. 4 minus 2 is 2. So we get times 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So we end up with 4 over 3. And that's it. So the key point is whenever you have a u substitution and you have limits of integration like this, you're supposed to change them. This is something that comes up in all calculus classes, so it's really, really important. Um, it's a really, really useful technique. It comes up in other math as well, like a lot. So yeah, that's it. In this video, we're going to evaluate this definite integral. So there is a trick to this problem. Um, you can do this immediately, and the answer is zero. So the answer is zero, and you can do it just by looking at it, if you know some stuff. So let me show you. This is really, really useful in um, higher level math and in math in general. If you, if you have a function, so if f is odd on, say, some interval negative a to a, so we'll talk about what odd means in, in a second, and you integrate f from negative a to a with respect to x, you get zero. So odd basically means um, when you plug in negative x into the function, the negative comes out and you get negative f of x. So in this example here, this is your f of x. So if you were to write it down, f of x equals x parentheses 6x squared plus 3 cubed, you could actually check the definition. You could, you could replace the x with the negative x, so your x would become negative x, and then here you would get 6 negative x squared plus 3 quantity cubed. And this is where the magic happens. This is still negative x. This negative, it's being squared, right? This negative x. So it's going to become x squared plus 3 cubed. So it goes away because of the 2. And then this is negative, and what's all of this? This is what we started with. So we proved it, we proved that this function is odd. We're going from negative two to two, therefore the answer is zero. So it's an extremely, extremely powerful technique. Just because it's worth learning some extra stuff. Um, what does it mean for a function to be odd graphically? It basically means it's symmetric about the origin. So as a quick example, something like this would be odd. Something like this, let's just say it stops here and stops here. This is called symmetry about the origin. This is an example of an odd function. So if you flip it twice, you get the same thing. That's how I think about it. So if you flip it, if you flip it down, you get that. If you flip it down, you get that. Flip it that way, you get that. So flip twice, same thing. So why should this make sense? Well, let's say you were integrating this, right? And you were going from here to here. If it's symmetric, this area here is the same as this area here, except this has a negative in front of it. So they cancel each other out when you integrate and you get zero. That's the idea. Because if this is positive two, this is negative two, and so it cancels when you integrate and that's why you get zero. So anyways, 
uh, got sidetracked there a little bit, but really, really important uh, fact. So if F is odd, you get that. I uh, hope this video has been helpful. Take care. In this video, we're going to find the area given in this picture. So this is the graph of x plus sine x, and we're restricting the domain from zero to pi. So we're looking for this area here. So this area here is given by the definite integral from zero to pi. So basically all we have to do is integrate this. So x plus sine x, and then we have dx and we have to go from zero to pi. We're, you, we're integrating with respect to x, so we have to use x's for our limits of integration. All right, so all we have to do now is integrate this. So to integrate x, uh, we use the power rule. There's a one here, so this is simply x squared, because you add one, and then divide by two. So one plus one is two, then you divide by that. To integrate sine, that's gonna be negative cosine. So the reason I know that is because if you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. But there's already a negative here, so it'll make it positive. Okay, so the derivative of this is negative sine, but negative and negative is positive. So when you integrate sine, you do get uh, a negative cosine. And I'll just put a line here, and we're going from zero to pi. All right, so first we plug in the pi. So this is equal to pi squared, whoops, whoops, pi squared over two, minus, and then plug in the pi, cosine of pi. So you always plug in the pi uh, first, and then minus, and now you plug in the zero. So parentheses, plugging in zero, we get zero squared over two. I'll even write it, why not? Minus cosine of zero. So this is cosine of zero. So boom, there we are. All right, so you have pi squared over two, pi squared over two. Cosine of pi is negative one, so this is, oh, minus, my, I'll, I'll write it, minus negative one. This is gone, okay, this is zero, so this is minus, this is, this is negative, this is one. Cosine of zero is one, so this is minus that, because this becomes one. So this is equal to, let's see, pi squared over two, and then one plus one, plus one plus one, because these will be, both become pluses. So we end up with pi squared over two, plus two. So this is, this is the area. So this area here, this area is given by pi squared over two plus two. Kind of cool. Kind of a cool uh, answer, right? We got some, some pi's in the mix. So whenever you have to find an area of a function that's above the x-axis, all you do is you integrate uh, from left to right. So you take your function and you just integrate from here to here. The reason is, if you remember, in the construction of the Riemann integral, what you do, this is actually equal to a limit, you approximate this with, with rectangles, and then you take the limit of, infinite, of the sum of infinitely many rectangles, and that gives you the area. That's what this is. This is actually equal to the limit of the sum of finitely many rectangles. So this is actually equal to a sum of infinitely many rectangles, and that covers this area, and that gives you the area. So I hope this video has been helpful. Take care. In this problem, we're going to find the area bounded by the graph of this parabola and the line y equals zero. So to do that, the first thing we have to do is draw a picture so we can figure out the limits of integration for the integral that gives us this area. So let's do it. So let's draw the picture. So there's the y-axis, there's the x-axis. So the line y equals zero is just like a horizontal line right here on the x-axis. So that part's uh, pretty easy. So I'll just do this to indicate that that is y equals zero. Then we have to figure out how to graph this parabola. So what I'm thinking is maybe we can set it equal to zero to find the x-intercepts. So it's a good first step. All right, so then we have to factor. I guess we can factor out a negative x. So pull out a negative x. That'll leave you with x minus two, right? Because negative x times x is negative x squared negative x times minus two is positive two x. So this is equal to zero. So it looks like we get two possible x-intercepts. x equals zero comes from here, and this one's going to give us x equals two. So I'm gonna come over here to the graph and just plot the zero, and then over here, plot the two. All right, so this has a negative number here, so that means it opens 
um, down, right? So it's a parabola opening down. So it cannot look like this because it has to cross at these points. That means it must be up here somewhere. So it has to do something like that, okay? There's no way for me to draw it down here because it would have to cross these x-intercepts. So then you know it opens down because it's negative. If this was positive, you know it would be opening up. Okay, so basically we have to find this area here. And we're done. So to do that, all we have to do is integrate. This area is given by the definite integral from 0 to 2, 0 to 2 of this graph. So negative x squared plus 2x dx. Okay, so all we have to do is work this out and this will give us the area of this shaded region. So to integrate this, we'll use the power rule. So you add one, so you'll get three, then you divide by that number. So this is negative x cubed over three, and then plus. Here there's a one, so you add one and divide by that. So it'd be two x squared over two. That's just gonna give you x squared. And we're going from zero to two. So everything looks good so far. All right, good stuff. You plug in the two first, subtract, then plug in the zero. So plugging in two here, that's gonna give us two cubed, which is eight. So this is negative eight thirds plus, and then two squared is four minus. And then when you plug in zero, it's all zero. So I'm just gonna do that. So now we have to add these up. This is negative eight thirds. Um, to add the four and the negative eight thirds, what you can do is think of four as a number over three. So 12 over three is equal to four. So 12 over three, adding these up, you just get four thirds, and that is the area bounded by the graphs. I hope this video has been helpful. Take care. In this video, I wanna talk about the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It basically says if you have a continuous function, that there is a formula you can use, and it's actually really easy. So if you take the derivative with respect to x of the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt, all you have to do, okay, is you just put the x where the t is. So this is just f of x. That's all you do. So let's do a simple example right away, and then maybe we'll go through the proof. Again, the condition here is that f is continuous. Let's do a simple example so you see how simple this actually is. It looks really hard, but it's actually really easy. So if you have d dx of, let's say, the integral, let's make the a a 2. Let's make this an x. Let's put something here. Ooh, let's put something weird here, something that you might not be familiar with. Arc sine of t dt. So according to the formula, all you have to do when you take this derivative you just take the x and you put it where the t is. So it's arc sine of x. That's it. So let's do another one, <laughs> one more, so you see how simple it is. d dx, let's do four. Let's put an x here and let's put um, e to the t squared dt. That's a fun one. So same thing. All you do is you take the x and you put it where the t is. So this will be e to the x squared. So that's how you use the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So whenever you have a number here and an x, and you take the derivative and it's set up just like this, you just take the x, put it where the t is. Take the x, put it where the t is. Let's do a really, really, really quick proof sketch, just so you see uh, why this is true. So this is like a proof sketch. I can be really formal here. So I'll just call it a proof and put it in quotes, just for understanding purposes. So our function's continuous. So what we can do here is we can use what's called the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So this says that this is gonna be equal to big F of X minus big F of A. If you remember this uh, from, from before, it was, B, it was big F of B minus big F of A, except this time it's X. Where big F is an antiderivative for little f. That means if you take the derivative of big F, you get little f. In fact, when you take the derivative of big F, you get little f. That's the definition, right? The derivative of big F is little f. This is a number, so it's just zero. So we just get f of x. So I hope this video has been helpful. Take care.
in this video, we're going to find the derivative of this. We're simply going to use something called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So the formula for the second fundamental theorem of calculus says if you have the derivative with respect to x of the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt, so if you have this setup and you take the derivative, it's a, that's a d, with respect to x, all you do is you put the x here. So this is equal to f of x. So in this case here, when we take the derivative, so all you do is you put the x where the t is. So this will be equal to the square root of x to the fourth plus one. And that's it. That's it. That is the final answer. So whenever you have an x and a number here and you take the derivative, just put the x where the t is, and that's it. Take care. In this video, we're going to find the derivative of this. We're going to use something called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The formula for the second fundamental theorem of calculus says if you have the derivative with respect to x of the definite integral from, let's say, a number a to x of f of t with respect to t, all you do is you take the x and you put it where the t is. So it's just f of x. That's all you do. So in this case, here, when we take the derivative, so big F prime of x, all we do is we take the x and we put it where the t is. So it'll be 3 square root of x cos secant x. And that is it. That's all you do. You just take the x and put it where the t is. I hope this video has been helpful. Take care. In this video, we're going to talk about a really important theorem from calculus. It's called the mean value theorem for integrals. Let's go through it very carefully. So the mean value theorem for integrals. We're also going to talk about something called the average value of a function over an interval. That's kind of almost like a consequence of this in our discussion. So first, we'll state the theorem, and then we'll go through the picture. So suppose... You have a continuous function. So suppose f is continuous on the closed interval, so on AB. So on AB. Okay. Then, and you can find the number. So then there is a number. There is a number. C and the closed interval, AB, such that the definite integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x is equal to f of c times b minus a. Okay. B minus a. So that's the statement of the mean value theorem for integrals. Okay. Um, if your function is integrable, in other words, if you can integrate it, there is another result that shows that the quantity 1 over b minus a, a to b, of x to the x is called the average value. So if you assume everything's good and it's continuous, you can think of this as f of c. So if it's continuous, this is called the average value. So f of c is called the average value of the function. So the mean value theorem for integrals is deeply connected with the average value of a function. f of c is the average value of the function. Let's uh, draw a picture so you see what all of this is, it's really, really interesting. So I'm gonna erase this, because we don't need it anymore. And I'll draw the picture up here. So this will be our y-axis, this will be our x-axis. So here's A, and then here's B. Okay, I'm gonna be careful here. This is F of A, all right? And then maybe here, this is F of B. So let's see, this is F of B, good stuff, and then um, maybe draw it like this. There we go. All right, there's our function. And so first, let's examine this. This is the area under the curve, right? So this area here, this is the area, right? That's the area under the curve, right? So the area under the curve, okay, the area under the curve is equal to this expression. So what is this expression? Well, the mean value theorem sa says there is a number c so I'm going to pick the number to be here so that the picture makes more sense. I'll do it here. So if this is C, this is F of C. OK. 
okay? So I'm just picking the number. And what you can do is you can draw a box whose height is f of c. So this is f of c. So f of c is the height of this box. And so what the mean value theorem is saying is that the area under the curve is equal to the area of the box, right? Think about it. If this is A and this is B, then this distance here is B minus A. So remember, the area of a box is the width times the height, right? The height of the box is F of C. The width is B minus A. So this is the height times the width. So the mean value theorem for integrals says if you have a continuous function, if it's continuous, right, there is a number c in the interval such that the area under the curve is equal to the area of the box whose height is f of c. And what is the height of the box? The height of the box is the average value of the function. Deep stuff, pretty wicked. So again, so if you have a and you have b and you draw a picture like this, you should be able to find a box that gives you the same area somewhere. So maybe, maybe this is that box, right? And the height of that box is called the average value of a function, right? So the height of that box is called the average value of the function. In this case, this here would be the value of c, right? And this would be your f of c. f of c is the height of the box. It's the average value of the function, right? The width of the box is b minus a, b minus a, b minus a, b minus a. The height is f of c, right? It's height times width or width times height. So the area under the graph is equal to the area of the box. All right, let's go ahead and, and do a simple example of uh, finding um, c, maybe. Let's find c. Let's try to find c. And um, let's try to um, find the average value. So I'll, I'll see if I can make one up. Uh, let's see, f of x equals, let's see, um, I guess it, we should be able to, to do this regardless. As long as we have a continuous function, right, this should work. Right? This is, the criteria is we have a continuous function on the closed interval. So if I make one up, we should be able to do it. Here we go. I'm going to try to make up the easiest possible one. f of x equals x squared. Let's just look at 0, 1. Okay. Um, let's, let's find the average value, uh, and then let's find the value of c. So the formula, the way I like to memorize the formula for these problems is as follows. Uh, remember, the, the theorem says you have the definite integral from a to b, and that's equal to f of c, b minus a. So if you divide by b minus a, you get f of c equals 1 over b minus a times the definite integral. So this is the formula I always use for the problems. It's just easier. Right? So I'm going to use this one. f of c is the average value. So if you had to find c, you just work this out, and then you set it equal to f of c. It's pretty simple. Uh, I hope. Let's find out. <laughs> So let's work out this piece first. That'll be the average value. So it'll be 1 over, so this is a and this is b. So it'll be 1 minus 0. And then we're going from 0 to 1. Right, so far so good. And then f of x is x squared. So x squared dx. That's just 1. And then, so it's, so it's just 1. So it's just 1, I won't write it. And then 0 to 1, x squared dx. When you integrate x squared, you get x cubed over 3. And we're going from 0 to 1. Then the fundamental theorem of calculus says you plug in the 1, subtract, and plug in the 0. So you get 1 third minus 0. Because right? 0 over 3 is 0. So you just get 1 third. So 1 third. So we worked this out, and we got 1 third. Right? So now we just take f of c. Oh, and what is this? This is the average value. This is the height of the box. Right? This is the average value. This is the average value of the function over the interval 0, 1. Right? It's the height of the box right? that gives you the same area as the definite integral from 0 to 1. OK, so now uh, we're going to find f of c. So how do you do that? Uh, well, how, we're going to find c, rather. Sorry, we're going to find c. So we'll set f of c equal to the quantity which we worked out, equal to the average value. Okay. And then we just replace c with what it is. Uh, so we f with what it is. So f of c is the same as f of x, except x is c. So this is c squared equals 1 third. All right, c squared equals 1 third. And then to finish, uh, we just uh, take the square root. So you get c equals plus or minus the square root of 1 third. Ah, but we had to throw one of these away, right? Because our c has to be in the interval. So we want the positive one. So that would be the value of c. 
I hope this video made sense and I hope it's helped you uh, understand uh, what the mean value theorem is. Uh, in the videos that follow, I have lots of harder examples of finding C and so on. The purpose of this video was mainly to give you the idea of what the mean value theorem is. In this video, we're going to find the value of C guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals for this function on this interval. So that's, that's a lot to say. Let me just give you the formula and I'll explain it. So we have f of c, this is the formula, and this is equal to one over b minus a times the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. So this is the formula that we have to use in this problem. This is a mean value theorem for integrals type problem. So this is called the average value of the function. This whole thing here, this is the average value of this function over a, b. We have to find c, we have to find c. So we basically have to work this out. So let's go ahead and work this out. So this is your a and this is your b. So this will be one over three minus zero. So one over three, because it's really three minus zero. And then we're going from zero to three. So zero to three. And then f of x is simply x cubed. So this is x cubed. Okay, this is um, a little bit easier than I thought. Okay, so three minus zero, three minus zero. I haven't done these in a while. Um, so now you just integrate, right? You just use the power rule. So this is one third. So you add one, so you get x to the four over four. That's the power rule for integration. And we're going from zero to three. So zero to three. Let's clean this up a little bit. Three times four is 12. So this is one over 12, x to the four. And then we're going from, from zero to three. Good stuff. Really, really nice math. Oh, big numbers here. So you gotta plug in the three, subtract, plug in the zero. So this is equal to, I'm gonna come here. It's one twelfth. This is three to the fourth minus zero to the fourth. Notice how I left the constant out. You can do that, right? You can let this hang out and then plug in the numbers. So three to the fourth, I gotta think about this. This is 1 12th, so baby math. Three to the fourth is three squared, three squared. Ah, I see, said the blind man. It's nine times nine, which is 81. So this is 81, so 81 over 12. So this, this is called the average value of the function over this interval, because this is f of c. So that's not what the question wanted. The question wanted the value of c given by the mean value theorem for integrals, but this is called the average value. So now we have to find C. So F of C is equal to this. So basically you just take F of C and set it equal to, to this. You can use X by the way. Most of the time when I do this, I just, I just put F of X here. That's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, I just wanted to be really perfect this time. And plus it's already on the board, so I just called it C anyways. But you can put an X here. So this is X cubed equals 81 over 12, okay, 81 over 12. And then to solve for x, you take the cube root of both sides, so cube root, cube root. So we end up with x equals the cube root of 81 over 12, 81 over 12. And I guess you could, you could work on simplifying this um, because you can write 81 as three cubed times three, and then the cube root of three cubed is three, and et cetera. But let's just, let's just leave it like this uh, because that might be easier and we can just finish because we're done. I hope this video uh, has been helpful. Oh, notice I called it X and here it's C. You know what that's called? That's called a mistake. So I'm gonna come back here and put a C here and put a C here.